Now, you're not going to give a predictive index test to um, the opposite sex, right, and say, well, but, but you probably should. The, the founder of uh, Samuel Adams, Boston Beer Works, a uh, Boston Beer Company, after the first date was going well, he goes, would you mind taking this assessment? And he, he, he gave the, P, the, the behavioral assessment, the PI behavioral assessment to his now wife. Welcome to the Spartan Up Podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up Podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Professional sports teams have been using data to select team members for decades. Today, Mike Zani talks about how you can use personality-based data to hire, manage, and maybe even parent better. Today's episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Nutrafol, clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness naturally. Go to Nutrafol.com and enter the code SPARTAN to save $15 off your first month's subscription. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com and the code SPARTAN. Joe DeSena here, founder and CEO of Spartan, where we attempt, we attempt to rip you off the couch, get you away from Netflix, and um, I don't know, get you moving. So I've got Mike Zani on the phone, CEO of Predictive Index. Predictive Index, if you don't know it, you've clearly been on the couch too long. There's a 67-year-old company, right? 67 years old. 67. And, um, and we use them at Spartan. And what they do, if you haven't heard from them, is um, they help figure out your personality type and traits and where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and how you can better collaborate with your team. Is that a fair assessment? That's, that's, a, that's a great definition. And, and, but what's really cool about it is it's super quick. Like you don't need to take blood. Um, it's not like I got to sit in a hospital bed for a while with a, with a bunch of psychologists around me. I mean, this is like 10 or 15 minutes, if that, maybe five minutes. Uh, it's six, on average, six minutes. Six minutes, I take the test, find out all my weaknesses, find out if I have any strengths and boom, we're, uh, we're in a better place. So. What gives you the right to run this company? Like, what, you were a coach, I heard, um, of a sailing team, U.S. sailing team? <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, former athlete. You know, I tried out for the 92 Olympics uh, in Barcelona and didn't make it. I was thinking about trying again in the next quadrennium for 96. And I, I didn't like, in sailing's a very expensive sport, so I, I had, you have to raise money to travel to events and afford the equipment. So I decided to earn money instead. So I started coaching, and I ended up coaching in the 96 Olympics, which was in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, the team had great success. And it was a very, you know, romantic time in my life. You know, lots of travel and far too much sun. Nice. And um, sailing's no joke. I mean, uh, what was your longest uh, trip? What, what, would, you ever, like, would you do any of those endurance trips? The, those athletes are incredible. The, the, the people who are sailing single-handed around the world are absolutely so mentally strong to be able to do that. No, I, I have not done that. I have sailed across the Atlantic, but the, the Olympic discipline are very short races. You know, you're out on the water for two, three hours, and it's, it's, it's about getting, you know, fractions of a percent of speed over your competitors, just highly refined uh, skill. It, it, you would be equivalent to, like, the swimming discipline where you're just eking out seconds. I never understood the starting line because how do you get the boats all at the same spot when the, when the, is it a gun? When it's not the gun, it's the, it's the, the siren when the siren goes off. There's, there's sort of a, there's an imaginary line between two points and the sailors become really good at estimating their boat, boat's position. So you're trying to get as close to that imaginary line as you can without crossing before the gun. Um, if you cross prematurely, you actually have to go back, and now you're in last, effectively. So it's it's really pushing the the the, the time space dimension, you know, quite a lot. So so anyway, obviously a high performer. How'd you end up running Predictive Index? We were a client for ten years. So my my business partner and I we met in in, in business school, and we started buying used companies with other people's money, and. Our first company was a mess from a talent perspective. And, and, you know, they don't teach you about managing talent in business school. You know, it's, it's sort of, they teach you a lot about finance and strategy, 
But the, the real leadership stuff, the, the, the managing people, building world-class teams, it's hard to teach. So we bought this company and for a year and a half, we were really struggling that the 45 people that we sort of acquired were not the people that we needed to run our new strategy. So we actually became clients of the Predictive Index, you know, 10 years before we bought it. So, and, and we fell in love with the product, but we also fell in love with, you know, winning with and through great teams. So when we finally bought PI in 2014, we had experience, you know, with buying and building three companies. And now we finally got to do it at PI. Not only did we get to build our own great team, but we got to do it for our 8,500 clients and really work on this discipline of talent optimization, which, by the way, happened in sport 30 years ago with Moneyball and Sabermetrics and is now just creeping into the business sphere. Yeah, that's interesting, right? When you, when you watch Brad Pitt in Moneyball, um, and I, I happen to know Theo Epstein pretty well um, from the Red Sox, right? And so he was one of those early adopters to this idea like, hey, we could look at stats and metrics and, and make better hiring decisions. Um, you would think that it's been in business forever, but now that, now that you've said it, I'm reflecting back on the last 40 years of my uh, business career, and I typically end up hiring somebody that's friendly with me or that I know or has a heartbeat or like I need somebody right now, right? And so I um, haven't necessarily put all that work into hiring the right person um, for that job. And, 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 and that fits in the team and the overall culture, right? Well, you brought up something really interesting. Humans are amazing at heuristics. You can look at a dog and know in milliseconds whether this is the type of dog you want to put your hand out and pet or whether you should be like hightailing it. Now, that heuristics has kept us alive and evolving for millions of years. But you use these same tools when you're hiring people. So you might say, wow, I really love this person. This, this person and I connected instantly. But you're bringing these biases, intended or unintended, to the table. You know, so if you're in a corporate environment, someone walks up with a neck tattoo, and you're like, ah, I can't get my arms around that, so they pass. You're like, that might be the best employee for the job. But, you know, some, some, some person in a suit on Wall Street can't, can't figure out the neck tattoo. So we, we bring this stuff to bear. Most people do it like you said you did it, where it's, hey, I got along well, we connected, this will be an easy relationship. And then you're like, you know, what did, what did you base that on other than that would be a person that you would like to, you know, pick up football or have a beer with? Yeah, that doesn't seem like the best um, methodology. It's also, by the way, it creeps into family discussion. Like I say to people all the time, I'm so lucky that I found my wife, but it was so random. And I'm sure it's so random for, for so many people in relationships. Now, you're not gonna give a predictive index test to um, the opposite sex, right, and say, well, but, but you probably should. Jim, Jim Cook, uh, the, the founder of uh, Samuel Adams, Boston Beer Works, a uh, Boston Beer Company, uh, he did. He's been a client of PI for, you know, probably 25 years. So in his, uh, uh, for his second marriage, his, his current, his, his current wife, uh, they, on, after the first date was going well, he goes, would you mind taking this assessment? And he, he, he gave the, P, the, the behavioral assessment, the PI behavioral assessment to his now wife, who, by the way, sits on his board and is, more, is a more successful CEO than he is, which is hard to believe. Oh, um, is it awesome. is awesome. So you can do it. It's not why we designed the tool, but uh, I think some crazies out there are taking it to the next level. I bet my kids would want to give my wife and I the predictive index, right? Because now they've already made the hires. We are their parents. Um, they didn't really have much choice in the decision. But, but, um, but can you, if, in that silly example, can you, as a kid then, say, all right, look, they are what they are. We got this mom. We got this dad. Uh, let's look at their attributes based on our predictive index and optimize for what we have. Is that, I mean, that, that's a good idea. I... We'll be right back to this interview. But first a message from today's sponsor, Nutrafol. Nutrafol is physician formulated to be 100% drug free. That's why they're on our show. They use natural medical grade botanicals in consistently effective dosages so that you get the most reliable results. 
When it comes to thinning hair, you do not have to choose between natural remedies and remedies that work. Nutrafol is a holistic solution, and it promotes healthier hair and a whole body wellness without drugs or prescriptions. Nutrafol is the hair supplement that goes beyond genetics, and it targets stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, and environmental factors that could be impacting your hair. You can grow thicker hair by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code SPARTAN. You'll save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. So one more time, that's Nutrafol.com, N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, and use the code SPARTAN to save that $15. As a kid then, say, all right, look, they are what they are. We got this mom, we got this dad. Uh, let's look at their attributes based on our predictive index and optimize for what we have. Is that, I mean, that, that's a good idea, right? Not only on the way in, but once you're stuck with them. Actually, I think everyone should be trying, trying to optimize these relationships. And these relationships are interesting because in business, you manage up to your boss, you manage across to your peers, you manage down to your direct reports. And you use you you manage differently in those different directions. So the, the the managing up, which is what kids would have to do to parents, when you manage up successfully, you really have to give your bosses, in this case your parents, you have to meet their needs. So if 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 one of your parents is an attention to detail, you know, very fastidious, say about time, you know, being on time, doing what you say you're going to do in in a time period. That, you know, you're like, even if you're not that way, you're like, I'm going to get more out of this relationship if I meet the needs of this individual who's very important to me. So if if you do those things, maybe you get, I don't know, permission to stay out an hour later. You get a little more slack when you didn't get the A. So I, I do think in every relationship, how do you modify yourself to meet the needs of that person? So kids would benefit by understanding their their parents' psychometric profiles and, and trying to meet those to the extent they can. I, I see that. I see the next big customer market for you is kids. Kids analyzing their parents. Give me some examples of, of hiring great. You no, know, it, it's, it's important because there's, there's not good or bad psychometric profiles. It's, it's really about fit. And the, the fit that you're talking about, it's not one dimension. There's, there's fit for the, the role, the job. So if you have an opening, uh, for a producer for your podcast, you know, and there's very specific demands there. And, and there are some positions like sales that have tight criteria where you're, you're, you're sort of like, you need to be high dominance, low patience, comfortable with risk, good communicator. So it's, it's very tight criteria, but there are other, there are other roles like product development where it's, it's completely open. And then you're looking for the next dimension of fit. How, how's your fit with the team? How is your fit with your boss? Is that the sort of, are, if you're going to add this to the team, is that the flavor that the team needs? Is it a fit with culture? So it's, it's, really, about, it's really about fit. And, and we, we, we work very hard on creating those benchmarks with companies to make sure they know what the role needs, they know what the team needs, they know what the company needs to move it to where it needs to be and making sure you're getting the right, you know, the right people. And you're in taking it up from left to their own devices, people get it right about a third of the time. And if you, if you really talent optimize hiring, you, you can get 90% accuracy in getting the right people that you need, which, which still needs improvement, but is, is a whole lot better than what people are doing. Do, you, do we do, um, do we do, do we lean in enough with you guys on, in our case at Spartan? Could we be doing more? Every, every company could be more because we're just could do more because we're, we're, we're baby steps. This is the first two years of Saber Metrics, you know, effectively that we've got another 30 years of what are the things that uh, will be predicting success going forward. And, you know, your your entire concept, um, you must you must do a lot of work around grit. You know, you probably know you probably measure people on grit unintentionally, just saying, this is a childhood friend that I know is one of the grittiest people I've ever met. And, and you would probably, you know, you're, you're a good assessment of that. But it's really hard to measure grit for hiring 
because there's no great test. The, the, the military does it with boot camp. You can't fake it through boot camp. At the end of boot camp, you're like, this person is gritty. This one, not as much. And But you can't walk into a test uh, or you know, in a hiring situation and, and measure grit. But there, we will eventually develop those tools so these dimensions will be measurable and actionable for, for building world-class teams. Let's go back to the children because I have a parenting book coming out and, then, and you have a book. Uh, so we'll talk about your book as well. But in the case of like the parents, me, my wife, we have four children. Do we give our kids predictive index? Like, should we should we have them go through the, the test? Well, there's there, the official answer is it's not validated for for anyone under eighteen. You know, we do all the validity studies, so it's there's there's a little bit from from a scientific perspective. You you shouldn't be using it on kids, uh, you know, for hiring. Like if you were at McDonald's and you're hiring fourteen and fifteen year olds, because it hasn't been validated. But I, I think. Um, kids' behavioral uh, profiles start solidifying around 12, 12 years old. So say the psychometric, uh, the psychometricians, and the IO psychologists. And you know, I gave uh, the the behavioral assessment to both my children when they were sort of ten and twelve, and I don't think I got really good reads because their vocabularies weren't there. My my ten year old at the time really filled out answers that he thought I wanted to hear, like he was just sort of saying. And he made himself this this goody two shoes. I'm like, you are not, you are not that child. But what what I did do with my my kids is I started narrowing in. I know the four dimensions that we measure, which are dominance, extroversion, patience, and formality. And I finally narrowed it down to I think I think my youngest was one of two patterns. And I actually handed them the reports. One was a venturer, one was an individualist. He read both reports and goes, I'm definitely the individualist. So while he hasn't actually tested out as an individualist, I manage him, not to the extent that parenting is managing, like he's an individualist. And Steve Jobs was an individualist, which is like, I want to do things my own way. I don't want to tell you about them. I'm doing it my own time frame, and I don't really give a darn what you think. And I am supremely unimpressed with authority. So you have to manage a child who's an individualist, their own North Star, they're unimpressed with authority, like, how do you manage such a tricky pattern? It's really helped my wife and I, you know, with this kid. So I would say that behavioral assessments for children are so helpful, but it probably only helps in the teen years because before that, you're not going to get a great read. Tell me, tell me about your book. Having access to, you know, 40 million uh, behavioral assessments and all of this data, you know, thousands of companies, you know, hundreds of thousands of of strategy assessments and job assessments, you know, having access to all this data and, you know, I felt compelled to bring this data to bear to say, can we figure out how to scientifically build world-class teams? So I ended up, you know, you know, the, the science of dream teams. And, you know, I, I hope there will be a part two in a few years when we get better at even analyzing the data. Like I said, we're early on in this, in this revolution of saber metrics for people and work. But I, I, felt, I felt I needed to write sort of a manual for talent optimization and using the data that we had. And it was, it was an exciting, I was a science major, so writing is, is not a natural avenue for me. Uh, so it was scary, but it was exciting at the same time. Give me um, three of the, 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 the best things that come out of the book for the would, you know, soon to be reader. Well, the first one is I'm trying to take a two by four to their head and saying, you've got to change. You can't do things the old way. You know, our number one competitor is is not another company. It's people just using their their old fashioned, you know, I go to a job board, do unstructured interviewing and then use my own biases. And and that's not going to work. So the first thing is get whacked in the head by a two by four. So you change the way you do things. I think the second piece is if you're going to build a world-class team, you have to go on a journey of self-awareness yourself. You have to be a very self-aware manager, leader, person in order to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are before you launch this, this campaign to build a world-class team. And you know, I, I think the third thing from this is, is making sure that you, you're intentional. What you, you, you know what you're trying to, to build. And... I think as a, as a founder and CEO, you had a lot of intent in, in doing what you did. 
But now, as, as, since your company is, is quite sizable, you have to share that intent with, with a lot of people and get them aligned around this. And I think if you, you need to do the same thing, say, what are we trying to build and how do I put a world-class um, you know, team together for that? And in sport, we do this all the time. If on Monday in football, you come up with a plan for the next team because they're a different team. You, you're not going to use the same personnel that won or lost you the game on Sunday. You need to put a new plan together. And that's the job of leaders is saying, what are we trying to do this next, in this next phase and build that team for it? I like it. I like it. I'm going to get the book. All right. For, for everybody, Mike, for everybody out there listening, watching, uh, I know that the big question in their mind is what type are they? So let's go through the, the four types and, uh, and if you're listening and you're watching out there, why don't you try to peg yourself? And then, Mike, I'm sure um, if people want to take the test, a quick quiz, you, you're, you're the kind of guy. You, is, there a, is there a resource, by the way, they can go and take a quick quiz? Yeah, actually, at, uh, the, the website for the book is dreamteams.io. And there's, there's a sample chapter as well as there's, a, there's an opportunity to take the behavioral assessment there. And the reason I put people there is there's a promise you won't be marketed to. You know, that's the book's link so that you can take the assessment, you'll be sent, you'll, you'll be sent your behavioral results in a report, and we're not going to market to you. Um, I, like I like it. So, so that is the promise. And, and, um, and so go break down the four ones uh, quickly so people out there could say, gee, I'm a, I'm a this. Well, there, there, are, there are actually 17 reference profiles, so we can't go through all of those. What, what there are, we measure four major drives. And you're either, you know, you, you can be, the first one is dominance. High dominance, you will want to put your thumbprint on things. And you, you will even undergo conflict in order to put your ideas into practice. Low dominance is more collaborative, more about the best idea, not my idea. And people are on a continuum of, of that. Um, my sense, you and I are probably both high dominance, which is a very common trait uh, for, for CEOs. The next, the, the next drive is extroversion, high or low extroversion. And I think our audience will understand that pretty, pretty well. The, the third is patience. And the high patience is more systematic. You do things in order, kind of like going through a cookbook or recipe. The order is really important and uh, would like to do things, you know, serially, one at a time. Low patients, you know, want, people want to juggle. Uh, they like pressure. They apply it to themselves as a natural tool uh, to, to motivate them. And the, and the third is formality, or the fourth is formality. High formality is higher attention to detail, more structured around rules. You know, low formality is a little looser. Uh, rules are sort of suggestions. And... It's, it's not just those drives, but it's the combination of those drives. Because when you're high dominance and low formality, you have a huge risk tolerance. But if you're high formality and low dominance, you have a risk intolerance. So there's, there's all sorts of cool things that come out of the combinations, which is why we suggest that people actually take the assessment. You're awesome. So one more time on where people can go. Dreamteams.io is the book's website, and you'll find a link for taking the assessment there. All right. Two high dominant folks are going to disconnect now. Do you think I'm right with the, the high, you're probably high dominance, low patience, low formality? Yeah, I think that nails me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Up Podcast. Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time. Today's episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Nutrafol, clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness naturally. Go to Nutrafol.com and enter the code SPARTAN to save $15 off your first month subscription. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com and the code SPARTAN.